Good morning, everyone. Today is the last of Antifed series. What are we waiting for? Great, and Judy's going to come and share with us later. So we're going to move into a time of sung worship. During our second song, we're going to take up our offering as a way of continuing our worship financially, giving back to God for the work that he is doing in and through this church. And in the first song, uh, there are going to be actions. So if you know the actions... Uh, you can come and join me up the front because I'm going to be leading them, which is exciting. So I'd love some people to come and join me because the young people who normally join me are singing. So that's alarming. Great. Fantastic. Let's hand over to Alice and the band. Great. Yep. A couple of oohs as part of it as well. Um, so it requires some energy first thing in the morning, um, but we can do it.
King is sleeping, oh what a glorious night, oh what a glorious night. Wonderful, great energy to celebrate what a glorious night and wonderful action, Sarah. Good enthusiasm. So this next song also requires that a little, it's, it's joy to the world, but it's slightly different. So um, repeat the sounding joys a little bit slower. I just wanted to warn you because we're not tricking you. Um, but also um, we will sing um, something that says, we will sing joy. God for the joy that you bring us. Thank you Jesus that you came down on earth 
that you were fully God and fully man. You came to live amongst us, to know human pain and human suffering. But you also brought us joy to be in relationship with you and the grace that you freely give us. We praise you this morning. Amen. that on a Sunday we can gather together as family, whether in the room or joining us online. And there are times where we have to share family news. And this morning, Judy has just got some sad family news that we are going to share today. Yes, so um, we heard very suddenly yesterday of um, the death of Margaret Wilkes, who uh, many of you know and love and has been an amazing part of our church family here for many, many years. Uh, Arthur and Margaret, very, very faithful in so many ways. And um, Margaret was ready for the party that we were having here. She'd had her nails done. She was in her party clothes. Um, We laid a place for her, which feels very symbolic now, uh, at the tea. And she had a, a stroke and died very, very quickly afterwards in heart. Hospital, um, and we're really sad to bring you that news. Whether you're joining us online or whether you're here in the room, but we are family, and our thoughts and prayers are with Arthur and with the whole family at this time. Uh, you will remember last year that Esme, their great granddaughter, was baptised, which just brought them so much joy and has been a real catalyst for uh, even increase of faith and inquiry in the family. And I know that was an incredible special day for Gareth, who comes along with. Esme and I think they might even come along uh, this evening so we do want to really just send all our love and prayers to Arthur and to David and Hilary I just want to say what faithful friends you guys have been um, and just a a glorious part of their family as well and David and Hilary were were there at the end as well as as well as the family were there Um, but it, it does strike me I mean we've had quite an upbeat start to the service and I think that's right because we sing joy over the life of Margaret. Uh, She lived fully and she lived well for many, many years and they were married for, is it over 40 years? 65. 65. (laughs) So quite a lot over 40. 65 years and some of you remember they did the story of their uh, relationship not that long ago and Arthur of course shared his story so beautifully. Um, But we're sorry to share that news um, but we do really want to just come together now and pray and thank God for the lovely Margaret. I have huge, beautiful memories of her, as I'm sure so many of you do, but she would always come at the end of a service and just put her hand in yours or give you a hug and just say something really encouraging. She just had that beautiful gift of quiet humility and encouragement, and she will be so missed, deeply missed by all of us here. So would you stand with us? And uh, we would just love to pray before the children and young people go to, to different parts. We thought it was really important that we do this together as a family. Um, so we're very mixed hearts of joy and sadness. So let's pray together. Laura, we want to thank you for the fact that Margaret yesterday was dressed and ready for a party that she'd had her nails done and that she was expectant. And Lord, we know and we believe that she is now at the best party of all parties, that she is celebrating the great feast, the great banquet with you, Lord Jesus, who she loved, who she served, who she followed. And Lord, we thank you that she is free from pain now, that she is free from some of the things that assailed her in this life, that she is fully alive in you, Jesus. And we pray for our lovely Arthur as he grieves today and for Tracy and the family and for Gareth and Esme and the wider family too and for David and Hilary and many, many friends here in this room and online that you would be our comfort, Lord God, that you would wrap us around with your Holy Spirit's presence with us in the grieving. Lord, one of your names, Holy Spirit, is Comforter. And we pray that deep comfort for all who mourn. Be with us now. 
And we thank you for the eternal hope that we hold on to for our lives, for Arthur and for Margaret now as she is with you, Jesus. We pray this in your beautiful name, the name above all names. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. There will be a prayer team later in the service during communion. So uh, if just any of the news that Judy shared, you'd love to stand with someone to pray, then there will be a team to pray with us later in the service. Um, as we are family together, we are going to be going into separate places now to continue with our learning about Jesus and our learning about Advent. Uh, so in a moment, our children and young people are going to go to their groups. Uh, if you are in school years uh, three to six, you're going to go through these doors. If you are uh, younger than school years three to six, you're going to go through these doors. Or if you're in our younger youth group, Rock, which is ages 11 to 14, then you're going to go through these doors. Uh, while the children and young people go, why don't you just take this chance just to say hello to somebody, welcome them um, along to church this morning. If, if anyone is able to help with school years three and four group this morning, we do need one more helper, um, otherwise the children will be with us. Um, it needs to be an adult, I'm afraid. Sorry. Group three to four. Oh, we've got someone. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Hello. So our next um, session is uh, the talk. So we're going to hear... Uh, it will be read for us um, by, who is reading for us? Steve going to read for us. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marvelled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, he gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. So Lord, we just pray as Judy comes to speak to us that your spirit, your Holy Spirit, will be upon her. Your anointing will flow as she speaks your word. Lord, in this waiting, we want to receive from you. We want to hear from you. Words of comfort words of encouragement, words to give us hope, words to tell us not to give up, but to wait upon you. For you are good, good Father. We bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> I might adjust this slightly for... 
I've really been blessed by this series on waiting, uh, waiting in the darkness, as we had a couple of weeks ago from Sarah, and then waiting with our party clothes on, which feels even more significant today uh, from Nate last week. And uh, we're now looking at waiting with our running shoes on, which I don't feel a particularly obvious choice for, um, but I wonder where, who has a pair of running shoes here? Just wave at me. Oh, there's a lot of us. Keep your hand up if you know where those running shoes are right now. <laughs> OK, slightly less of us, I feel. Um, where are they, I wonder? Are they by the door? Because you, you're using them so regularly that they're there just to pick up as you go off to the gym or you go off for your morning run. Are they in a box somewhere unopened? <laughs> you know, they look nice, but you haven't actually opened them up yet. Are they in your gym bag? And, and everyone will have a different answer to that. Some of us might not even know quite where they are. Um, but there's something about the readiness of the running shoe that is applicable as we look at waiting with hope and waiting with activity. Because waiting can feel passive, can't it? It can just be this sort of, how long, oh Lord, how long? But Actually, we're going to look today at some activity in the waiting, some hope in the waiting, some breakthrough in the waiting. And we're going to hear a lovely story of breakthrough now from Ali Beard, who's sharing her story. And she has this lovely phrase that she puts her boots on with Jesus every day. So this is Ali's story. So this is my story. I, I grew up in a nominally safe Christian home, but I always believed somehow... Um, that my existence was toxic and I should never have been born and that has been eating me up since childhood. When I was 11, um, Jesus met me. He tapped me on the shoulder, stood in front of me with his arms open and he told me he utterly loved me. I can still remember the words he said, you know, I've died for you, only you. You were the single only person in the whole earth, I'd do it. And by me dying, I've saved you. I've given you a lifeline out of that dark self-hatred that's killing you inside. I've done it. I've paid the price that was on your head. And the evil and darkness aren't going to swallow you up. I'm here to set you free from that self-loathing inside. I've come for you, Ali, to make you whole. Surrender. So I did age 11, I was utterly struck and there was nothing else I could have done. And I remember thinking this is going to be inconvenient, I've got my teenage years, but I was bowled over that he loved grubby, broken me. Over 40 years later I'm still a Christian simply because I believe that that historical person of Jesus actually was the Son of God, God himself. I believe it's true. There's plenty that's mysterious and confusing and that I'll never understand, but I know the truth of Jesus. Jesus has been my rock, my center, my deepest love since the age of 11, and around him my world makes sense. He's the lover of orphans, the helpless, the needy. He is justice and he is radical. Every day, I, that's the way I like to see it, I put my walking boots on, and we do a walk together, Jesus and I. We do the day together, two sets of feet going forward. And I hold his hand. Psalm 46, at the beginning goes, um, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. So that's my story. No one can refute my story my life and my lips I hope tell the same story so there that is that I wanted to share so beautifully expressed uh, by Ali there um, with her walking boots on doing the day with Jesus and him taking hold of her hand every day and I there was so much of that I loved the conviction that she had this vision that she had of Jesus at the age of 11 that she can't refute and I'm sure there will be times in her life where she is questioned as Ali said there but she is still following him with her boots on every single day 
And I think as we think about running shoes, some of you might feel a bit kind of, oh, I don't feel like I'm running very far at the moment. It might feel more like you need your walking boots rather than your running shoes. But there's a sense of readiness and there's a sense of confidence in who Jesus really is in the waiting and in the walking. And we have in the passage that Steve read for us two beautiful examples of breakthrough coming in old age breakthrough coming after years and years of waiting, waiting faithfully for the expected Messiah, waiting faithfully for Jesus. And we're going to look briefly at three aspects to this, remaining active in the waiting, remaining humble in the waiting, and remaining hopeful in our waiting. And it seems to me that as we look at what waiting does, we wait for breakthrough. And all of us over the last few weeks, I'm sure, will have been thinking and praying into areas in our lives that feel stuck, that feel broken, that feel hopeless, that feel like dead ends. And actually in the waiting, remaining active, remaining humble and remaining hopeful can really, really help us. I know in my life, in in prolonged seasons of waiting, there has been changed, not necessarily always in my circumstances, but in me. And I think that is is one of the most beautiful things that we see in Simeon here and in Anna, a sense of they're not going to leave the temple courts. They're not going to leave. They're holding on. They're hanging on in this. They're staying close to God. We read about Simeon. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And then let's look at this bit. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. He was active in his waiting. Moved by the Spirit, there was something, there was what we call an unction or a a, a prompting of the Holy Spirit, a hunch maybe to be there at that time. And I think that's something that can really encourage us as we wait, that there will be those moments as we hold on where the Holy Spirit says, go there, do that, change that one thing, and breakthrough comes. May not always be once like that, but actually how many times has this guy done this? And then suddenly he has breakthrough through. He remains active. He remains faithful. And we read, if you look, there are the times that the Holy Spirit is mentioned. Now, this is quite different because the Holy Spirit is something that we believe that Jesus gave to the churches that he left for us, his power within us. But what we hear here is that the Holy Spirit was on Simeon, that actually there was anointing on him to be the one that would hold the Messiah and lift him up. The picture that we have as we look through Advent of the baby Jesus being lifted high, being lifted up in the temple courts. The Holy Spirit did this work. And I would say, I was reflecting on this this weekend, the Holy Spirit, if you haven't met him yet or prayed that he would fill your life, he is the helper in our waiting. He absolutely is. Yes, he points us to Jesus, but there is a power in the Holy Spirit, his power and his presence, the fruits of his spirit that help us in our waiting. The very fruits that we hear of the Holy Spirit are things like patience and self-control and peace and joy, the infilling that Simeon clearly has here that lead him. And Simeon is one of the characters, like John the Baptist, that really is part of the unfolding of the work of the Holy Spirit. And if that's something you'd like to explore either on Alpha or with one of the prayer team at the end of this or with one of us as leaders we'd love to talk to you about the work of the Holy Spirit because I grew up in a church that was very loving and very beautiful in many ways and God was mentioned a lot and Jesus was mentioned a lot but we did not hear about the Holy Spirit and I kept trying to be good trying to become a Christian trying to follow Jesus and wondering why for some reason was I just a bit like Ali was I just too bad or was I just too full of shame for Jesus. And the Holy Spirit was the one who convinced me that I was loved, that I was forgiven, and there was a hope for me. So I just say that because it's so highlighted in this passage, the beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. How do we remain active in our waiting? 
And then along comes Anna. She has never left the temple. She is worshipped day and night, fasting and praying. Now, I don't know about you, but does that intimidate anyone? Is that something we're always, I don't see us all in the prayer room every single morning, don't fasting and whatever. So I can read that and I think, oh well, boy, that's why Anna got her breakthrough. But that is not the gospel. We don't know, but we can be pretty sure that there will be times when Anna questioned, times when she wondered what on earth was going on. But what we do see is a woman hanging on to the truth that she would see the saviour, the truth of the living God, the truth of breakthrough. And I think that is really important for us. But we don't know also what her worship was like. We don't know what her prayer was like. We've looked at lament over the last few weeks. She may have at times been really, really confused. She may have been shouting at God. She might have been wrestling with God, as many of us are today. But she had that relationship. She stayed close to him. Anna goes on and actually tells everyone. It says that she goes and tells everyone about this breakthrough. And part of our testimony is not just our breakthroughs. It's our waiting as well as the breakthroughs. She goes and she has seen breakthroughs. But actually, a lot of the stories that we've been sharing here on Sundays are about times of waiting, times of struggle, and then seeing the glorious intervention of Jesus and his power Let's not stop meeting together. The Bible is clear on that. It is part of our waiting and it is part of our expectancy. A few of us just this week were talking about how tired we felt on Thursday and we had community group and we sort of needed to rally to get there and people had done long days. And then we had this wonderful time together. It just reminded me that we are family, that we need each other in the waiting. We need each other as we remain faithful when it's hard. In contrast, if we can just go through to Habakkuk in the Old Testament, there's a lot of waiting there. He talks about being the watchman on the wall, and he kind of juxtaposes what we might feel like in our waiting. He says, look at that man, bloated by self-importance, but soul empty, but the person in right standing before God through loyal and steady believing is fully alive, really alive. So actually, what waiting does is it does humble us it helps us remain humble in the waiting in the change we are waiting for change but actually the change happens within us and i would just say that as a new christian at the age of 19 i thought everything was just going to fall into my lap and i even had somebody say to me oh judy your life just seems so great and i was like that's because i'm a christian <laughs> you know they didn't punch me that they probably wanted to but but there was a sense of naivety in that that i thought everything would happen in the right order that i thought everything in my life would fall into place bit by bit and i I was so sure about that and I thought that was what our witness is and actually I would say often the opposite of that has been true that things haven't always gone as I thought they would that I thought prayed that they would but actually I know that the work that God has done within me in the waiting I am not a patient person by nature I like things quick some of you have seen me either walking or even maybe driving or I'm getting better at that Um, but I do like speed and I do like things to happen quickly that's how I'm wired and I really know that in my waiting God has done a work and I've needed his Holy Spirit as so many of us have in our chapters of waiting but what it does is it keeps us humble I know that I would have been a bit (laughs) I don't know the right word for it the polite word for it but really a bit of a pain I think in many ways if everything had fallen into my lap uh, at the time that I thought it would and actually it's made my theology I think go deeper with Jesus in trusting him but actually it has been uh, a journey of holding on to his hand and saying I surrender Jesus. If you look at Simeon's world, if you've got um, the passage open in Luke 2, there's something called the nunc dimittis, um, which is about his confidence, Simeon's confidence, that he says, I can die happy now. I can die at peace uh, in a beautiful way. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you can now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Uh, I don't know if there's a tune. Is, does, do people know about the tune of the Nunc Dimittis? 
Yes, it's a sort of song. I used to play it on the recorder, which I'm sure for my family taught them a lot about waiting, <laughs> waiting and suffering probably. But I do remember playing it and I remember being struck by these words uh, from quite an early age that there was something beautiful about someone waiting and saying, now I can go and be, to be with Jesus or be with God because I've seen what you promised, I've held on. And these are beautiful words uh, expressing hope now and eternally. I read this week, God didn't just look down at Christmas, he came down to be with us as a baby that would change our world forever, eternally. He came to bring rescue and salvation, as Ali so beautifully said in her story. He came to bring rescue. So in our waiting, we have breakthrough in circumstances. We have breakthrough in us, but we also have a glorious hope ahead of us as we remain hopeful. One of my favorite people in the Old Testament is Abraham, because really he does a lot of waiting. He does a lot of wrestling, but he does a lot of waiting. And I wanted us to just look at three little excerpts where God speaks <coughs> excuse me, to him. God takes him outside and he and Sarah are not able to, to have a child and he takes him outside so he leads him out under the sky and he feels God say look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them and then he says so shall your offspring be and I can imagine Abraham is absolutely gobsmacked you know to see that many stars and to say that is what your offspring will be like. That will be, if you like, your legacy. And then we read in Romans 4, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Let's just highlight that because I think that's the point. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of nations, just as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. And then finally, and so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore expressed in Hebrews 11. And we have a trajectory there of Abram having a vision that seems absolutely impossible to him and actually waiting until the outcoming, the outplaying of that happens. And there is a pattern in scripture that has helped me enormously, and I, I hope just to remind us again of it, is reveal, reverse, restore. If you look at nearly any story in the Bible, you will see that pattern. If you take Jesus' story, it's certainly there. Something is revealed. It all goes into reverse. He dies. People grieve. They're like, why? What have you know? It is what he said true. Going through all of that wrestling. And then suddenly, three days later, his resurrection and restoration. And it's the same for Abraham. And I believe many, many, many times in our lives, it's true for us as well that God gives us something, a picture, a vision, a confidence, a promise even that we are holding on to. And it seems to go worse before it goes better often, doesn't it? It seems to go into reverse. But God is always active and he is always working for our good. He is always doing something behind the darkness. We read uh, in Psalms, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. And I've included a little picture there, uh, really because the clouds may have eclipsed the sun for you right now, but the sun is still there. And I, I just prayed into that picture that actually behind it all, behind the darkness, behind the mystery, behind the muddle and the confusion, the sun is still there. God is still at work. His power is still the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Joy comes, wait for it, wait for the dawn. Keep coming to Jesus, as Simeon did, as Anna did. Keep bringing our hope to him. Because we have, through Jesus, as Ali shared, our ultimate hope. 
that all of us are waiting. The whole of creation is waiting. I love the fact that God took Abraham out to look at the sky. I don't know about you, but I feel closest to God often out in creation, uh, usually by the sea, which is quite hard, isn't it, living where we do. But actually, there will be ways that creation fuels our hope, even though creation itself is waiting for renewal and redemption, groaning, if you like. It can lift us. I remember a time um, when I wanted to give up on my faith. I wanted to be with a guy and I I wanted everything else to to change so I told my dad I'm going to go for it and just so you know I'm not a Christian anymore just so you know and my quiet dad who some of you uh, uh, know very well or knew well um, he just took me out into the garden and he loved his garden my dad and he just started showing me things and I thought this is quite a random exercise I just told him I'd given up on my faith and he just started showing me how a flower was and showing me things in bud and taking me around the garden. And it has stayed with me. And he just looked at me and he said, Judy, God did this. And he does it in season. And he does it in times of waiting and times of fruition and times of harvest. And that has never left me. A little bit like Abraham and the starry sky. And it may be that you too need that reminder today that actually, just like all of creation, we are waiting for the renewal that will come, the day that will come, the party that will come, that Jesus has made a place for us. I loved the fact that we had a table set yesterday for Margaret. There was a place there waiting for her. And that's so symbolic now of actually the place that is set for Margaret But actually, as we say, I trust in you, Jesus. I trust in you in the waiting. I trust in you in the wrestling. I stay active. I stay prayerful. I stay close to you, Lord God, because I believe that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And as Ali said, she had that vision. She had that absolute revelation of who Jesus was at the age of 11. And he is still revealing himself to people today, every single day. And it may be that you've never prayed a prayer, that you perhaps hearing that testimony was the first time that you'd really heard the difference that Jesus can make in your shame, in feeling toxic, in feeling that you shouldn't have been born. Those are lies that we can believe and there is a truth that there is a purpose and a beautiful, beautiful plan for your life and for every life that God has created and that he has made as we remain hopeful. J.M. Packer says this, optimism is a wish without warrant, but Christian hope is a certainty guaranteed by God himself. Optimism reflects ignorance as to whether good things will ever actually come. Christian hope expresses knowledge that every day of his life and every moment beyond it, the believer can say with truth on the basis of God's own commitment that the best is yet to come. Waiting can bring circumstantial deliverance and freedom when our circumstances change. It can bring personal deliverance when we ourselves change. But ultimately, Jesus brings deliverance from our sins, deliverance from death into life, from despair into hope. The good news of Advent is not that we are faithful in our waiting, we often aren't, but that God is faithful in his coming. He is coming again. We believe that as Christians. We believe that he came as a baby in fragility, in humility, and that actually he had a time of great waiting. If you look at Simeon, as he turns, lifting the baby, he turns to Mary and he says, a sword will pierce your own heart too. That actually there's a foretaste in Simeon that he, Jesus, will suffer greatly before all things are restored in resurrection. And I wanted to close, really, as we come to respond, in just saying, is there a hopeless end in your life at the moment? Is there an area that just feels like that cul-de-sac, that hopeless end? And we would love as a prayer team or as any of us here to just pray for endless hope in your waiting, that he might transform that kind of hopeless end into an endless hope in who Jesus is, Rick Warren says that the world waits and hopes for the best, but we wait in Jesus, who is the best hope. I love that. 
that actually rather than just crossing our fingers and hoping for the best, we have Jesus who is the best hope in our breakthroughs and in all that is ahead of us. I read this this week and I wanted to just sort of really claim this over all of us as we pray into those areas of hopelessness for which the Messiah came. When everything looked dead, finished, hopeless, that is when the Messiah came. His second coming will be similar. No, he won't come as a helpless baby born in a feeding trough, but as the glorious resurrected king of the universe. I wait for him. Expect him. Don't let the darkness fool you. The king is coming. Would you stand with me? And I'd love to pray for us. And it might help you to hold out your hand in your area of waiting or if you feel pain for someone else right now. And I would love to just pray for us that we would remain hopeful, that we would remain active, and that we would remain humble, knowing that God can do all those miracles that we can't. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that your spirit moved Simeon to a place where he suddenly saw the fulfillment of your promise. We thank you for Anna, never leaving your side, always longing, always waiting. And in her 84th year, suddenly seeing breakthrough. We thank you for Abraham under the starry sky, reminded of all the promises, all the descendants that would come as a result of you, God, and your faithfulness. And I pray now for my brothers and sisters here who are tired of waiting, who are weary, who feel that they have come to a kind of hopeless end, that you would renew hope this morning within them by the power of your Holy Spirit. That you would lift our heads, that you would lift our hearts towards a horizon of hope that we wouldn't be a people of despair, but a people of devotion, however desperate that devotion may be at times, that we would be desperately devoted to you, Jesus, knowing that you are at work in the darkness and that joy comes in the morning. And we are so thankful, God, particularly today in the loss of our beautiful Margaret, that we know that our loss is heaven's gain today and that you eternally have broken through for us that you have prepared a place for us with you through the death of this baby lifted up in the temple all those many years ago who went through it all, endured the cross all for us, Lord Jesus, and rose again, rose again for that resurrection hope that we rely on now, that we sing about now, that we pray into now, Lord. And we want to say, Lord, we're not giving up. We're not giving up. We're clinging to you, Lord. We're putting our hand in yours. We're not giving up. And we believe for the day when you will raise, we will raise our banners in triumph when you bring victory in this life and in the life to come. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
to respond um, uh, with the Lord's table, Lord's supper, which simply means we come together, we come to the Lord's table in waiting, 
in humility to receive what he has prepared for us, to receive that which brings healing to our lives, which restores hope in our hearts. So we got the Jewish, we got the bread, reminding us of the body of Christ broken for us. The body of Christ wounded, stricken for us. And so I'm going to read this passage. Um, First Corinthians 11. Should we take a seat? Verse 23 to 24, 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to use some words on the screen now to respond as we move into a time of communion. So please feel free to join in or maybe listen to the words as they're spoken. And once we've used them, we're going to go back into a time of sun worship. And then please do feel free to come and um, share in the communion. We've got um, the bread and the juice at three stations around the hall and the gluten-free bread is in uh, the bowl. So maybe if the words could come up on the screen. They're on this screen. <laughs> so let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So together, let's say. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. I can invite you to stand. We're going to continue in our sung worship and please do move and take communion as you would like to. And we're going to be welcoming our children back in soon as well. If you do have younger children in the creche age group, then if you could go and collect them from their room once you've taken communion.
Just as we continue in our time of worship to say that the prayer team are available at the back and they would love to pray with you, whether it's for yourself, whether it's for someone else. Just that sense, as Judy said, of standing with someone else. And it might be even after what Judy said in her talk that you just want to pray to say, Holy Spirit, come and fill me, maybe for the first time. Maybe just that sense of refreshing to say as we move into this Christmas season where so much is going on, where life can feel so busy and so full, actually just holding out your hands and saying, Spirit, come, fill me. Let me know that sense of your presence dwelling in me, working and living through me. Uh, the prayer team would love to pray with you. So if you are able, let's stand as we continue in our song worship. And if you would like to go and receive prayer, they would love to pray with you. Sing all heaven declares. All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. Who can compare with the beauty of? Forever 
for such a wonderful morning. You've been in your presence. You've been with us. You are our comfort. You are our strength. He knew we find hope. He knew we are restored. We worship you. We glorify you. Thank you for you are closer to us. Thank you for you continually sustain us. Thank you. We will never, never leave us. Never forsake us. Because you are always close to us. We bless your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take seats, please. As we come to the end of our service, um, I just want to say it's just been a beautiful morning, regardless of the sad news, God has been with us and God is with us. Uh, I was reflecting on the scripture as a scripture in Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, Thou keep in perfect peace, whose mind our state on you. And as we go to the rest of the week, can you stay your minds in God? For we trust in him. He is faithful. Amen. Beautiful. So uh, we got hope and lunch um, um, at one o'clock. So please go your way and come back for lunch. Fantastic. And we've just got some announcements about Christmas. Uh, everything that we're going to announce, you can find on the Riverside Church website. So please do go along to our Christmas page. Or if you're here in the room this morning, there are our Christmas flyers. So do take some, invite uh, others to come along. It's a brilliant opportunity this season to invite others along to all that's going on. So next week is our big Christmas extravaganza, which is our Christmas uh, carol service with drama, with dance. It's going to be a fantastic time. That's taking place at four o'clock and seven o'clock next Sunday afternoon. And that's not going to be here. That's going to be at St. Anne's Church, which is just down the road in Moseley. And again, all of the details of the address for that you can find on our website. We would love to see you all there and do invite others along. There's been so much work that's gone into it. It's a brilliant community event and it sounds like it's going to be a fantastic service. So we're looking forward to seeing you there next week at four o'clock and seven o'clock. Yeah, and that means there is no service here next Sunday. Yep, so next Sunday morning, there won't be any services here, so don't come along in the morning. Um, and the four o'clock extravaganza service will be live streamed, so you can uh, catch up on that online as well if you'd like to. Uh, Riverside Performing Arts are currently on tour around local Birmingham primary schools. They are touring their show, Snow's White Christmas. I got to see one of the dress rehearsals, and it was an absolutely brilliant show, sharing the gospel message in such a creative and wonderful way. So please... Did you like it, Samuel? Yeah. There you go. There's the biggest endorsement right there from Samuel Davis. Uh, we would love you to be praying for them as they continue in their tour and as they go around schools. But they will be performing that here at Riverside House on Friday the 22nd of December at 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock. It is a brilliant opportunity for us as a church family to get behind them and support them for all they have been doing out in the community on behalf of us sharing uh, the love of God to so many. So tickets can be brought online and again details are on this flyer. That's right. And... Christmas Eve services on Sunday, or Christmas Eve, 24th, we'll be meeting here, 9.30 and 11. And because we're having open lunch on Christmas Day, we won't be having open lunch on Christmas Eve, but we will be having open lunch next week before the extravaganza. So you can come and fill yourself up on food and then go along to the extravaganza. And then just find, say, our Christmas Day service won't be live streamed. So if you want to join us on Christmas Day, we're going to be here in the room at 10 o'clock and we look forward to seeing you there. And Sarah, can I say also on Christmas Day, there'll be a Christmas meal here at Riverside House. Great. Have a lovely rest of your day. God bless you all.